the New America Foundation. My name is David Gray, and I direct the Workforce and Family Program, and it's my pleasure on behalf of the Foundation to welcome you to our event today, Finding the Balance on Extended Time Off. We appreciate your taking time to be with us, and we say thank you to all those who are joining us as we wa watching this event as we stream it live on the Internet. As we approach Father's Day this week, there is renewed attention being played to the rights of working parents as well as the responsibilities of society to support them. One of the topics of attention as a possible area of support is the extended time off from work given to employees to care for newborn children, for adoption, for elder care, and for other activities. This past Sunday, Sharon Lerner wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post that reminded us that discussions about how best to provide extended time off have a long history in our nation. Since the passage of the Family and Medical Leave Act 17 years ago, there's been widespread and persistent discussion about how America should best provide extended time off to its citizens. Many Americans need paid leave for family and for caregiving because of a serious medical condition. However, there are serious concerns about how the leave is used, about how it impacts business, and about how extended time off could best be financed. And not just the federal government, but the states and municipalities have obviously taken a crack at finding a best solution. And the private sector has renewed their attention toward this area and looking at new ways to provide extended time off. In the face of a protracted economic downturn, we must ask ourselves the question about what is the timing in the future of extended time off policy within the context of workplace flexibility. We know the Obama administration as a candidate, Obama campaigned on grants to states for paid leave and discussed paid leave in his most recent budget. The main congressional vehicle in this area, the Healthy Families Act, has about a half of the Democratic Congress, but only half the Democratic ca caucus, I should say, as co-sponsors and no Republicans. Meanwhile, as Lerner's op-ed reminds us, other countries have taken a very different approach than our nation as far as extended time off and continue to develop initiatives that should be noted. So what is the right balance as the private sector and many employers provide extended time off as a recruitment and retention tool? And what is the right responsibility of the public sector to provide time off? Well, we're fortunate to have an outstanding panel of guests to be with us to discuss this today. Full biographies are available outside, so I'm not going to go into the details, but let me welcome first Dr. Jody Hyman, the Canada Research Chair in Global and Health Social Policy at McGill University. Among other publications, Jody is the author of Raising the Global Floor and Profit at the Bottom of the Ladder, both of which you'll see outside for sale. Jody, it's a pleasure to welcome you back to New America. In just a minute, Seth Harris will be with us. He's coming from another meeting. Seth is the Deputy Secretary at the U.S. Department of Labor. He has a long background in these issues himself. He's testified last November in Congress on the administration's position on extended time off and will be again joining us in just a moment. Sharon Masling is the Senior Legislative Counsel at Workplace Flexibility 2010 and has helped lead WF 2010's efforts in the area of extended time off. And she, is, along with Katie Corrigan, a director of Workplace Flexibility 2010 at Georgetown Law, will be speaking as well. And we appreciate our partnership on these important issues. And Lisa Horn, the health care manager at the Society for Human Resource Management, will be speaking next. I've been very impressed with Sherm's leadership on workplace flexibility over the last 13 months in particular, but before that, and with Lisa's leadership on this issue in particular. We appreciate the support of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and its leadership in this area as well. Following these four speakers, we will open up for questions and for your comments. Again, thank you for joining us today for what should be a, good, a great discussion. And we'll begin with Jody Hyman. Jody? Thank you, David. Hi, it's a pleasure to be with you all here. When you go up to Capitol Hill, the central question has long been about extended leave. Is it affordable? That's also the question on Wall Street. In the current economy, now more than ever, that's the question. Well, part of the answer we know. Uh, one thing we know is that for families, not having the extended leave is not affordable. 
We also know that it's become less affordable in the current economy when people have lost what assets they have, when they have lost what savings, when that's been diminished, the amount that they can cover their own parental leave, their own sick leave, is markedly smaller. Wall Street Journal today, Sue Schellenbarger tells the story of a middle class family landing in poverty. So what happens? They give birth to a sick child, they have the double whammy, a birth and an illness in the family. We know from our own research, 15 year national US study, that the leading cause of job loss after you control for the local economy, you control for people's education and other factors include person's own health, giving birth to a child and a sick child. That still leaves the question though, is it affordable for government to do something about it? Is it affordable for business? And if it is, how do we do it? Well, the good news is the answer to those questions, I think is yes, I'm not giving that um, loosely or easily. We finished a two global studies, both of which I'm going to review briefly here. One looks at countries around the world that have paid leave policies in place and what are their economic outcomes. The second looks at companies in countries from North America, Europe, Latin America, Africa, Asia, competitors around the world and looks at their experience. So I'm going to spend most of the time on two things. There's lots of different kinds of paid leave, but for the lengthy leave, they largely fall into paid sick leave or paid parental leave. Now, so this is the picture people often think about when we're talking about the Healthy Families Act, paid sick days, something acute. You're sick for a short period. You've, they may not in the United States, you might not be wearing the face mask, though other countries may be more sensible about decreasing spread, but you've got the flu, H1N1, what do we do? However, the long-term leave is more important when it comes to serious illness. So the long-term leave is what happens when you get cancer, when somebody in your family gets cancer, when a child gets a serious illness. So before I go into this map and the data, I just want to give you a background of what we did. Uh, this is part of an eight-year study. It's the one that's it's out there in raising the global floor, but it's also online, all the data, and I'll show you where that is in a minute. Um, eight years, we went around the world and we looked at all the labor policy, all the labor law, who has paid leave in every country. 190 out of 192 UN countries. We're missing two South Pacific islands, but other, other than that, we've got everybody else. And then we said, what are the economic outcomes? Not in one year, but what are the economic outcomes over a 10 year period? What are employment rates? Does it really lead to higher unemployment? What is the competitiveness? Competitiveness as ranked by the business community and academics through the World Economic Forum, which are the most competitive countries and what are they providing? So first, what the story is on who has leave, for those who are in the back and who have eyesight like mine, all you need to be able to do is see what's red. Red means you have no paid leave. The United States is red, as is a few other countries. 163 nations around the world guarantee paid sick days. Dark blue means you have at least 26 weeks or until recovery, at least six months. So those are the long-term countries. And you can see um, that much of the world has these long-term leaves. Okay, well, what about the most competitive countries? And this looks at countries that are consistently among the most competitive in the world. So they were in the most uh, competitive for at least eight out of 10 years. And what you can see here, just going through the list, is practically all of them provide a month or more of paid leave. So in no way is that making them it, is it making it impossible for them to compete? Who are the exceptions to the month or more? Uh, the only ones, Australia, seven to 10 days, Singapore, Switzerland, each of which have at least two weeks in the United States. Everybody else is a month or more, and most of those, by the way, are six months or more. Now, the other argument is that it leads to higher unemployment. But here again, the story is that 
in terms of those countries that are able to be in the lowest unemployment in the OECD, here we focus on the advanced economies. That's because unemployment data is most reliable for the advanced economies. You'd find similarly no, no causative relationship in terms of leading to unemployment in the whole world. But even if you just look at the advanced economies, what you see is that other than the United States and Korea, they all have leave and the overwhelming majority have at least a month. And again, of these, if you looked at the details, the overwhelming majority have many months. What about paid parental leave? So when I, I gave birth, I remember shortly after going back after what in the United States was a reasonably long leave, two months unpaid, had to delay my job start, but meeting another woman in the bathroom who had given birth six days before and was coming back. So that's why I throw up this hospital picture first because much of the reality is extremely short leave. If you look at through our voluntary system in the United States, how many people get paid leave, very few, it's a very small fraction, get any kind of paid parental leave under 10%. And much of that leave that's taken is extremely short. Now, from the picture of health, what you would actually like is reasonable length leave. That, that's why we've got here the baby sitting up. The health recommendations in terms of breastfeeding are at least six months. The ability to provide quality infant care, much more expensive, much harder to do. So you would want a reasonable length of paper and a leave. Now, what's the global story? So, this map shows where the United States stands in terms of paid maternity leave. Here you can see that pretty much the only countries that are red, the United States, Australia, I do need to make a note about Australia. They've already pa passed that they will have paid parental leave in 2011. So that is going to change colors shortly. You can see listed the other countries, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Swaziland, Samoa, Papua New Guinea. It's not even fair, by the way, to Papua New Guinea to list them here because you do get six days of paid sick leave in Papua New Guinea, which you can use for maternity leave. Um, the United States is in an increasingly rarefied atmosphere not to provide any kind of paid parental leave. Well, okay, we are facing economic challenges. Is there reason to worry about this when it comes to the economy? So again, here's our data, World Economic Forum, top business leaders and academics rating countries as the most competitive to the least competitive. How did these list here are all the countries alphabetically that made it in that list in, as the top most competitive in eight of the past 10 years. What you find is that other than Australia and the United States, every single one provides paid maternity leave. Again, Australia will as of 2011. You can also see the duration of that leave quite long, right? So in, in the majority of these countries, it's at least nine months. In quite a few of them, it's over a year. It's <coughs> relatively rare that it would just be 14 to 16 weeks. Now, what about the low unemployment countries? Is it a problem? Can you not sustain employment if you have paid maternity leave of decent duration. Here are the OECD countries. They're the better performers in terms of unemployment for eight of 10 years. And every single one except the United States offers paid maternity leave, clearly demonstrating the feasibility. And again, you can see from duration, these range from three months to two years, but with the majority agreeing that it should be at least six months. Father's Day is coming up. I have to tell you that the news about fathers is less good. There's less paid paternity leave than paid maternity leave. That has to do, I think, with the history of the movement globally, that paid maternity leave was one of the first uh, basic rights and basic benefits that swept the world, and paid paternity leave is has followed later, and that's why you can see much more of the map lacks paid paternity leave. However, if you look across Europe and high income economies in Asia, you will see that the majority of countries do provide paid paternity leave. Again, 
no problem in terms of competitiveness, overwhelming majority providing paid paternity leave, who doesn't, uh, just Australia, which will shortly, Switzerland and the United States, Switzerland, which by the way, not a model for gender neutral policies being one of the last in the OECD to pass voting for women. <laughs> How about low unemployment? Again, you can see countries able to have low unemployment and have this paid parental leave, paid paternity in this case. That's the public sector picture in a nutshell. If you look at countries around the world, most have found a way, we can talk in Q&A about the details about how they're funding it, they're funding it in different mechanisms, the extent to which the, the funding vehicle is a partnership between employers, employees, and government, it, it's bipartite, it's tripartite, it's different versions around the world, and we can talk in more detail about that. But pretty much the entire world has found a way Again, you know, over 160 countries in paid sick leave, 177 in maternity leave, all of the top competitors to provide these. What about innovation in the private sector? We have a separate study. This was a six-year study where we looked at companies around the world in every region that were improving the conditions of their workers at the bottom of the corporate ladder. Now, we focus there for two reasons. One, the argument has been that that's where it's least affordable to do it. That these are the workers where jobs are most likely to go overseas, where it's most competitive. We also focus there because it's where the need is greatest. Now, that study, Profit at the Bottom of the Ladder, focuses on a wide range of innovations. Beyond this, I'm happy to talk to people afterwards about it. It does look at what companies are doing to improve wages, asset building policies, profit sharing, compensation packages, and how they do it in ways that make the firms more profitable, what their strategy is that links it to productivity. It's across all sectors. We purposely look at very small companies, 27 employees, large companies, 126,000, Fortune 50 companies, and in every range of industry. But for today, well, we're each being briefed to make time for everybody. I'm just going to mention some of the findings about extended leave. And I want to tell you about companies in two different scenarios. One is a country where there actually was a lot of public policy. So Isola is a roofing manufacturer in Norway. This is both a high wage economy and an economy where there are a lot of guarantees. So five weeks of paid annual leave, a year of sick leave for your personal health, 10 to 30 days for family health. How did the company make it work? Right? They're, they're competing with low wage and lower benefit countries within, within the EU with fair, relatively low trade barriers. And I just want to mention two insights, one on the practicality. When they had long-term leaves, one of the most essential things they did was cross-training. You have to. You just can't survive if employees can't work across areas. But there are huge benefits of the cross-training beyond the paid leave. So what they found was that whenever people are absent, which whether or not you provide paid leave, they are absent. If a baby's born, there are absences. When somebody's sick, there are absences. They were much more able to adapt to those absences. But second of all, totally unrelated to the leave, when the economy switched, when they had to adapt to cons competitive constraints, they had employees who were much more able to switch lines, and they were much more effective as a result. Now, in a totally different environment, Auto Leave Australia. So you've already seen the maps, Australia. It's catching up to the United, you know, moving away from the United States, catching up to the rest of the world, but it doesn't have much policy on the books yet. Auto Leave Australia a company in the automotive industry, they're making safety devices, a particular challenge operating in a high wage economy in a very competitive industry. One of the things they found was that what their employees wanted most was what they summarized as time. 
So they tried to figure out how to give them time. And among the ways they gave them time was uh, more extended leave, ways to get factory worker sabbaticals, ways to give four weeks paid leave instead of two weeks paid leave. They were cost neutral. The employees were actually sharing the cost, though they would work extra hours if they wanted to keep their wage similar. But uh, the employees want them. Why? Because it was the only way to get this leave. It made a great difference. Now, what was the challenge? Again, people had to be able to work across factory lines. Benefited them tremendously when the economy was doing well. Why? Because their uh, recruitment costs went way down when their turnover went from 15 to 20 percent annually down to 3 percent incredibly low in the, this particular sector. But when the economy was bad, they had to adapt again, huge benefits to them. So I'm going to close, but I do want to say there's plenty of more information. We have two websites where there are free downloads of both of these, www profit at the bottom, because profit at the bottom of the ladder seemed pretty long for a website title, <laughs> dot org. <laughs> you, can, you can download a bunch of the fundamentals of the report, including the conclusions for free. That's the private sector side. www.raisingtheglobalfloor.org is the public sector side. And I'll mention, I don't have a laptop in this setup, so I can't demonstrate it to you. But this is a live website where you get to pick what around the world you want to map. So you pick which, what countries you want to compare, what you want to map, and it's all there to do. So in summary, I think the story may not have been straightforward when the United States embarked on this journey of trying what has largely been a private sector voluntary option. It wasn't clear whether most, most individuals in the United States would be covered, but we do know now. The, there at least half of the private sector is not covered for paid sick leave. The overwhelming majority is not covered by paid parental leave. Even those covered for paid sick leave are covered for a short period. This is starkly different than the rest of the world. It's very clear that it's affordable to the rest of the world in terms of they can still compete and they can still have jobs. It's also very clear that this is extremely costly to American families that we can't do and that they need to rely on resources they don't have for it. So I hope we're going to see change happen and I hope we're going to hear from Seth Harris about how we might make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jody. <clears throat> the, the, both for the research and for the presentation today. I think we will hear from Seth. I don't see, is Seth here yet? I don't see Seth here. Um, he will be here in a, in a moment. Um, uh, but we're, we're looking forward to um, Workplace Flexibility 2010. And if Sharon and Katie will present next, that would be great. All right, well, I'm Katie Corrigan. I am the director of a project at Georgetown Law School called Workplace Flexibility 2010. And I was going to say that I'm pinch hitting for Sharon Masling, but now I'm going to say that I'm cross trained to do her job. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, did we accidentally go forward? Good. Well, um, first of all, I did want to, I, I think some of you in this crowd have seen us before, and about a year ago, we did a big report on what we call flexible work arrangements and focused our attention on flexible scheduling. And uh, you know, we're a project out of Georgetown that for the past five years has essentially kind of came into these issues fresh. Um, we defined the terms of the conversation as we saw it. So we came up with this framework of workplace flexibility that included what we thought flexible work arrangements, things like reduced hours, alternative schedules, predictable schedules, um, particularly for low-wage workers, time off in short increments and in longer increments, and then what we call um, career maintenance and reentry or career flexibility. Just the fact that over the course of our lifetimes, we're going to be in, out, dialing down, dialing up, getting retrained um, in lots of different ways at lots of different times. So how can the workplace account for that undulating line as opposed to that straight line through a career? So. Um, but today, you know, the last year or so, um, I would say we've been quietly working on a report on extended time off. 
Um, that doesn't mean we started this work a year ago. We actually started looking at these issues that Jody um, has surfaced in her presentation when we first started five years ago. But one thing that we found difficult in this particular arena was to find a point in the public policy discussion where we felt it would be a starting point where the business side or the employer side and the employee side could agree on something. So unlike our flexible work arrangements platform where we felt like there was lots of points of alignment and consensus, we found that the issues around time off were a little trickier. So we basically took a step back this past year and really did three things. Um, one, continued to dig into kind of conceptualizing the issue and defining the terms of the debate. Two, really understanding the landscape on the data. So Jody just gave us a great presentation on kind of what's happening around us. Um, we've spent a lot of time really shining a bright light on what is happening in the U.S. And then three, what you'll hear at the end is um, we're kind of almost to the point of putting our pencils down on our report, but not quite. So we'll outline some of the questions that we um, are, have grappled with and are still grappling with in terms of how to shape public policy in this arena. So first, um, on extended time off, um, just sort of to distinguish it from other things, we look at it as a time taken off from work for a single reason that extends for more than five days, but less than a year. That was something we just came up with, mainly to distinguish it from things like a paid sick day where you just need a one-off, something what we call short-term time off, or from episodic time off, which is often taken in even shorter increments. So imagine if you're a person that has migraine headaches, you take time off, you know, maybe just half a day because one came on, but you're able to take medication and go back to work. So um, reasons for EXTO, you know, I think they're all pretty intuitively obvious. Um, caring and bonding for a newborn or newly adopted child, um, providing family caregiving, recovering from your own illness or injury, but also things like to serve in the military or to further one's own education and training. Now, I think these last two actually are quite salient given the state um, of many of the biggest policy issues we're facing right now. But what we've focused on are those first three, because those really surfaced um, to us as kind of the most immediate, pressing, and compelling based on some of the demographic issues that we're facing. Um, so things like the need for EXTO, new children. Um, you know, over 4 million working age women ages 15 to 50 had a child. You know, so this is just kind of outlining the state of play. Um, you need EXTO for health issues. So data from employees who took EXTO under the FMLA, 52% took FMLA leave to care for their own health conditions, 13% took FMLA leave to care for a parent. 12% to care for an ill child. Again, just to kind of give you the sense of what people are doing with their time. Um, the needs around caring for others. You know, this is something that I think there's a lot been written about in terms of the aging of the population and that we're all going to be doing a whole lot more caregiving over the you know, next generation. Um, you know, do employees get paid when they take these periods of extended time off? Um, Approximately 65% of employees who took FMLA leave reported receiving some pay during their leave. And this is one area where I would just distinguish some of the kind of um, talking points or headlines on slides. So Jody talked about the fact that we do not have any national government policy that provides for different types of paid leave. One of the things that we really did, though, is that doesn't mean that we have no access, right? I mean. To state that we have no access to it wouldn't be completely accurate because there's a whole lot going on in the private sector. So what we really tried to do was almost map that. And seeing Jody's slide makes me realize when we actually do release our report, we need to come up with some nice, nicer visuals. Um, <laughs> we're not quite there yet. But um, you know, so what we sort of really tried to understand was, OK, so how are people paying for these? Obviously, sick leave. They're using their vacation leave sometimes. They're using their personal leave. They're using TDI, temporary disability insurance. But so, OK, so they're sort of cobbling it together. But who's calling it, cobbling it together? And multiple sources, 43%. One of the really important things we found is, OK, yeah, so they're cobbling it together. But again, they. Who's they? Huge variation. You know, um, I would say in terms of access, very, very dependent on your income level. So highly paid professionals. A lot of those private sector policies, a lot more available. Everybody else, um, huge variation. Huge distinction based on full-time or part-time status. 
huge distinctions on education level, kind of connecting into the income. Obviously, employer size and industry, you know, kind of what's the norm in the rest of the industry, who are you competing against makes a difference. Union membership makes a big difference. And obviously, state of residence. There are some states that have temporary different disability insurance on the books at the state level. Um, in California and New Jersey have family leave building off of that. So there's a lot of different variables. And again, just to give you a sense in terms of um, some of the specifics, access to temporary disability insurance, 30% um, of all workers have access to, um, to short-term disability. So a lot of that is obviously usually for your own health. 52% of workers with an average wage of $15 an hour or more have access. Again, 26% of workers with an average wage of $15 an hour have less. Again, income level. Access to disability insurance by worker characteristics, this again just kind of breaks out some of that same theme just in different ways in terms of white collar and blue collar. But again, that full and part time is, makes quite a big difference. So um, specifically designated parental maternity or paternity leave, so putting aside your own illness, um, there's not a whole lot that's really specifically called leave, you know, for maternal fraternity or paternity. Oftentimes, um, the way people get maternity leave is through the short-term disability. There's kind of a, a legal fiction, <laughs> in a sense, that's created for people who are about to have babies that they have a short-term disability, and that's how they're able to access maternity leave. That doesn't count for paternity leave or um, for gay and lesbian people who are the partners. They can't access through short-term disability any of that leave either. So um, again, some, in summary, lack of pay um, was what number one reason why workers who needed leave did not take it. <coughs> Nearly 90% of those who needed leave um, said they would have taken leave had they received some or additional pay. Um, again, while some private sector employers provide paid exto and some state laws mandate the provision of wage replacement, um, no meaningful federal policy. And I feel like that just got explicated quite clearly. So, you know, for us, where did that take us? Um, a couple places. One, we felt like in terms of where we wanted to spend our time and our resources, our energy, we felt like one thing we really could contribute is to think through how do you structure federal policy to change this fact that people don't have access to paid um, family and medical leave. And we focused on the pay, we've, we've also focused on job protection, but this particular talk we're focusing on the pay for all the reasons Jody said, you know, oftentimes that's the first place of, you know, we can't afford it, we can't do it. But again, just the facts on the ground around the demographics, right, I mean, in other con conversations I've gone on much longer about how the world has changed, um, women in the workforce, dual earner couples, aging workforce, people with disabilities in the work, I mean, there's this long string that I can go through that explains the world has changed and workplaces essentially need to deal with it. So we felt like one of the kind of pieces of added value we could bring is just a very close look at how could you construct federal policy in this area. But again, because we are who we are, we actually didn't go in with any frontline assumptions. Um, we spent years actually going through different types of conversations with both employers and employees, sometimes informal, sometimes very formal, like our National Advisory Commission on Workplace Flexibility that had 25 people from lots of different perspectives talking through these issues for over a year. So we, we spent a lot of time sort of already looking at these issues, but about a year ago we just sort of took a step back and said, or two years ago we said, okay, how can we do this as a federal policy matter? What tools are out there for us to use? Well, clearly, you know, we had some examples from the state level, um, you know, in terms of how um, there's temporary disability insurance at the state level. Then some states have built out family leave on that. We also looked at um, not just sort of a traditional social insurance. We also looked at a private savings account type of model. We also looked at um, sort of tax credits p potentially for low-income people since obviously they're not getting access to different types of paid leave. But again, no one of these tools, one of the things we were struggling with is how do you get a tool that really gets across the board? Because again, access varied income, part-time, full-time status. So it wasn't just kind of rich versus poor. <laughs> you know, this was something that was impacting everyone across the board in different ways. So sometimes you might just need to supplement it Sometimes you needed to actually provide that basic baseline. So 
ultimately, when after we'd gone through our four policy models and had various discussions, we have landed. And so for the last um, 12 months, we've really focused on how do you build a national insurance model in this arena. And, have, and I'm going to let Sharon speak to some of the tougher questions that we've talked to. But um, I did just want to note, this past year, we also got some help <laughs> um, because we felt like this was a project that a lot of people were working on, but we essentially decided to join forces with a group out at UC Berkeley Law School um, that's run by a woman named Anna O'Leary called the Center for Health, Economic, and Family Security. So really through this very unique collaboration between two different um, academic institutions, we've been able to kind of join forces and had the luxury because of the Sloan Foundation to take a year and really dig into these questions, have a bunch of people um, shoot arrows into them. And I think we've talked to a bunch of people in this room um, about some of those issues over the past year. But I'll let Sharon just kind of surface again what we think are some of the key or tough policy questions, and then that'll lead, I think, nicely into um, the Deputy Secretary and to Sharon's talks, too. Um, thank you, and thank you very much to Katie for being cross-trained and pinch hitting. Um, as you can hear, oops, the, what did I do? Um, as you can hear, I'm in the process of losing my voice yet again. It was gone last night. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. Um, as Katie said, I just want to basically walk you through the issues that we're struggling with right now. Um, as Katie said, we're close to being able to release our recommendations. Um, we're still dotting the I's, crossing the T's, and working through some of the issues, um, some of the outstanding issues. So for today, I just want to sh show you what we've struggled with as we go from, OK, there needs to be a policy, there should be a policy. Well, how do you create a policy, and how do you make it work given the reality of living in the United States, the way our government struct is structured, the way our insurance system is structured, the way employers do business, how can we make this work? Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through some of the questions. Our goal, again, is to create a national social insurance program that would provide meaningful income support um, to help workers deal with their own illness or injury, to care for and bond with a baby, or to provide care for family members or close personal relatives. Um, one of the first issues we looked at was financing, as Jody had allu alluded to. Who's going to actually pay for the benefit? Do you pay for it by a payroll tax through general revenues or something else? If a payroll tax, is it both employers and employees? Um, if the tax is on employers, should it be experience rated the way unemployment insurance is? Um, if a payroll tax, what should that rate be and how should it be determined? Um, and should employers be able to opt out of a public scheme if they offer their own comparable or better plan? Um, who's going to actually administer the benefit? Is it an existing agency or system or a completely new one? What responsibilities should that system have? How would a person actually go about applying for wage replacement? How long after they um, applied would they actually receive the money? Often, for extended periods of time off, people need the money quickly. Um, should there be an appeals process if they're denied? If so, what would that look like? Um, who should be eligible? Uh, should there be eligibility tied to a specific label of, excuse me, specific level of labor force attachment? And if so, what would that look like? Um, should eligibility depend on the size of the employer or the length of employment? Um, how much wage replacement should an individual receive? Um, how should that rate be determined? Should it be based on some incentives, such as shared caregiving among men and women, um, sufficient income support for individuals who are unable to work? Um, how do you provide enough wage replacement and yet don't provide an incentive for people to um, take time off and get paid when they actually could still be working. Um, should the benefit be a flat rate? Should it be a percentage of earnings? Should the percentage vary depending on wages? Um, how long should the benefit be provided for? Can it be taken for episodic periods of time off? Um, how does this intersect with workers' compensation? Should the benefit amounts be the same for occupational and non-occupational injuries and illnesses? 
um, employer interests. Um, what additional cost, in addition to a potential payroll tax, what additional cost would be on the employer? Um, what replacement costs, uh, depending on the type of system and how it would be administered, what potential administrative burdens would be placed on the employer? Um, how do we minimize fraud and abuse? Uh, education and outreach, one of the issues we hear a lot about in California is that there's not enough knowledge about how the paid family leave program, about its existence and how it should work, what education and outreach should be um, provided, and what other lessons can be learned from employers' experiences with the FMLA, with California and New Jersey paid family leave, with state TDI laws. Um, and then finally, worker protections. Um, what legal protections are necessary so that people will take extended time off? If we're creating a new policy, should there be a job protection provision? Um, some of what we've also heard in California is that some people don't take the time off even though they will be paid because they fear losing their jobs. Um, if, should the job protection be tied to the FMLA? Should it be provided to everyone who receives a benefit? Is there something else in between? Um, and then we've been spending a lot of time just looking at current law and what types of job protection people are currently entitled to. Um, so we hope to have our report in the fall. Um, stay on the lookout. If people are interested, we will be doing a big announcement, so check our website um, and stay tuned. Thanks, Sharon, and thank you, Katie, for your leadership in this area, and we can't wait for the uh, report this fall. The Honorable Seth Harris has taken time to be with us today, and we're grateful for that. In addition to being the Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Labor and helping to manage that large department, Seth is also well steeped in the policy areas that we're discussing today, as well as all those within the Department of Labor. He's testified as recently as November, I believe, in Congress on this particular issue, and we're grateful, Seth, given your schedule that you've been with us today. Please join me in welcoming Seth Harris. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I'm, and thank you very much to the New America Foundation for inviting me to join this distinguished panel. You know, when you stand up and talk about this subject following Jody, Katie, and Sharon, it's, it's a pretty good bet that everything that needs to be said has already been said. So the best argument for my speech today, I guess, is that uh, while everything that, that needs to be said has already been said, it, it hasn't been said by me. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and like Sharon, I want to apologize, start by apologizing for my voice. Uh, one of my sons was nice enough to share his cold uh, with me, so I'm going to sound a little raspy and I may let out a cough every now and then. I, I want to assure you this isn't some clever ploy to illustrate, you know, how a sick worker should deal with their life. Honestly, I'm not that clever and uh, not willing to make that kind of sacrifice. Um, uh, it won't be news to anyone here that the talk of Washington, the talk of the nation is jobs. Uh, American workers are experiencing one of the highest unemployment rates since the Great Depression. 15 million workers are out of work and searching for jobs. Nearly six and one half million workers uh, have been out of work for more than 26 weeks, the so-called so, so long-term unemployed. So we need our economy to continue growing and creating millions of new jobs, but our goal at the Labor Department is to assure that these newly created jobs and those that survived the Great Recession, will be good jobs. Jobs with rising pay that narrow wage inequality, jobs in safe and healthy workplaces, jobs that assure health benefits and retirement security, jobs that provide a voice in the workplace, jobs in fair and diverse workplaces, and most important for today's topic, jobs that assure workers have the flexibility they need for family and personal caregiving. Now, note that I didn't say we need workplace flexibility so that women will have good jobs. That's true, but it's also not complete, as Katie was just saying. Certainly, women make up almost 50% of the workforce, and women's labor force participation rate is at a historically very high levels. And while the demands of work have grown, women remain our society's principal caregivers. When a child or a family elder falls ill, Odds are that the mother, daughter, niece, or daughter-in-law will be called upon to provide the requisite care. And so women need flexibility to continue to play their essential societal roles, both as caregivers and productive workers. 
But workplace flexibility is not merely a story about women in the workplace. Rather, there is a larger story, which Katie uh, referenced, uh, about our nation's shifting demography, the growing diversity of workers in the American workplace, and our broader understanding that good jobs should be for everyone, that everyone should be included. Americans are living and working longer, and more people with disabilities are seeking entry into the labor market, and those groups, on occasion, need the flexibility to care for themselves. In fact, the most commonly requested workplace accommodation for workers with disabilities is time off from work. If we're going to include workers with disabilities and older workers in the workplace, and it's essential that we do so, then we have to assure that greater flexibility in their work arrangements is both possible and protected. Further, families with two working parents are now the norm, and there are many more single working parents. When a child gets sick, someone has to care for the child. So working parents of both sexes need the, the flexibility to be able to do so. The Family Medical Leave Act was a major step towards addressing the needs of older workers, workers with disabilities, women workers, and working parents. But the FMLA doesn't cover everyone, as you all well know. Workers employed by businesses with 50 or fewer employees are not covered, and many part-time workers are still not covered. But just as critical as coverage, many workers simply can't afford to take the unpaid time off that the FMLA protects. A 2000 study that I'm sure you're all familiar with that was conducted by the Labor Department found that one of the most common reasons workers cited for not taking FMLA leave was that they simply couldn't afford to go a week or longer without a paycheck. They needed paid leave, not unpaid leave. <clears throat> in 2008, excuse me, <clears throat> in 2008, BLS surveyed private sector employers about their leave policies. You've seen some of this data. Uh, so I walked in as Katie was presenting some of these data. Approximately seven in 10 employees received paid leave to attend jury duty and funerals, but only 61% of private sector employees were offered sick pay for their own illness or injury. A mere 37% of employees were offered paid time off for personal reasons, and only 8% were offered paid leave for family reasons. And the problem is especially acute for low-wage workers. In its March 2008 National Compensation Survey, BLS found that 83% of the highest paid workers, meaning those workers in the top decile, had access to paid leave, uh, paid sick leave, I'm sorry, compared with just 23% of the workers in the lowest decile, the lowest 10% of wage earners. In addition, 54% of the highest paid workers were able to access paid leave for personal reasons, compared to 17% of the lowest paid workers. Low wage workers have less access to paid leave and thus are more likely to go to work <clears throat> even if they are sick or their child is sick. Only 49% of low wage workers have access to paid sick leave or personal leave or family leave or even paid vacation. Particularly vulnerable are the 3.7 million working adults in households with children under 14 years old and no other adult or older child to help to participate in the, in the child rearing. Single parents and low wage workers can find it challenging to stay home even for a few days. This lack of access to paid leave forces many workers to choose between taking care of their health and the health of their families and paying their bills. This is made even more troublesome when we're talking about sick workers who feel they must show up in the workplace or working parents who have no choice but to leave a sick child in school because the parents couldn't take time off from work. When the illness is contagious, like the pandemic H1N1 influenza we experienced last year, an employee's decision to go to work when ill or to send a sick child to school can pose a genuine and serious threat to public health. Imagine a restaurant worker or a healthcare worker who becomes ill with H1N1. We must honestly acknowledge that it's an open question whether this worker is entitled to leave under the Family Medical Leave Act. Workers can take, as you all know, workers can take job protected uh, unpaid leave under the FMLA only when they experience a serious health condition. There are no guarantees that H1N1 or other significant, if not serious, contagious diseases satisfy that standard. 
But even if the worker has a condition that does qualify under the Family and Medical Leave Act, can we expect these low-wage workers, like a restaurant worker or a healthcare worker, to take unpaid leave? Most are living paycheck to paycheck, even in the best of times. Leave would cost them whatever savings they have, and if they have no savings, which is, let's be honest, more likely, they could cause them to fall weeks or even months behind in their bills or lose a home or the place they live. And if the FMLA does not protect these workers, staying home could cost them their jobs. It should be obvious that we're expecting too much from these workers under our existing laws. The economic cost to working families associated with a lack of paid leave is significant not only during times of, of influenza pandemics. These are decisions that working families must make daily, choices between keeping their jobs and taking care of their health or taking care of their children. The costs for families are real and substantial, but they actually represent a relatively small share of total compensation costs for employers. In its June 2009 Employer Costs of Employee Compensation Survey, BLS calculated that all types of paid leave for private industry add up to 6.8% of total compensation costs, or about $1.85 per employee hour out of $27.42, an average compensation. The lowest paid occupational group, service workers, earn on average $13.15 per hour paid leave for that group amounts to a mere 4.2 percent of their total compensation. Earlier this year at the White House Forum on Workplace Flexibility, President Obama told us that workplace flexibility, quoting now, workplace flexibility isn't just a women's issue. It's an issue that affects the well-being of our families and the success of our businesses. It affects the strength of our economy, whether we'll create the workplaces and jobs of the future that we need to compete in today's global economy. <coughs> That's the very heart of DOL's vision in this arena, and Jody's work echoes the same themes, I'm sure she's told you. Good jobs, including jobs with workplace flexibility, can be good for everyone, families, business, and the economy as a whole. Now, since FMLA was passed, the law has been expanded to help military families with caregiving responsibilities, and Congress has extended protections most recently to flight attendants. But as we approach the 20th anniversary of the FMLA, we should ask ourselves, why haven't we taken a next big step forward in tackling some of these important challenges? The FMLA is certainly an important means of protecting workers who need to take time off for family caregiving or personal medical reasons, but the FMLA doesn't go far enough. So where do we go from here? First, the Labor Department has made workplace flexibility a prominent part of our strategic plan for the next six years. We believe time off issues and other forms of flexibility are core work for our department, and we're developing strategies across different parts of the agency to promote this agenda. You can't solve a problem without giving it the requisite attention. So paid leave will be a focus of President Obama's Labor Department. Second, the FMLA, as I've said, only provides job-protected time off for serious health conditions not for short-term illnesses or for regular medical appointments. And this lack of access to job-protected time off, paid time off, forces many workers to choose between taking care of their health and the health of their families and paying their bills. For this reason, the Obama administration's endorsed the Healthy Families Act. This important legislation, uh, authored among others by Senator, the late Senator Ted Kennedy, would provide workers with economic <laughs> security by assuring that they have seven days of paid sick leave every year. Workers at all income levels will be able to stay home if they're sick without fear of losing their jobs or being forced to go to work because they can't afford to stay home. Third, <clears throat> millions who are covered cannot afford to take advantage of the FMLA's guarantees. As I said, the FMLA says that employees can't be fired for taking unpaid leave, but as Katie noted and as I've noted earlier on, there's no wage replacement guaranteed by the, family fed uh, the Federal Family Medical Leave Act. In fact, 78% of workers who need but do not take FMLA leave say they simply can't afford to take time off without pay. So we must continue to develop ways that working families, working parents, can take the time off they need and still support their families. The President's fiscal 2011 budget is seeking $50 million 
to establish a state paid leave fund within the Department of Labor. This fund would build on efforts in some states and some of those that Katie outlined in her presentation to find a path to providing workers with paid leave. As it's currently conceived, the fund will provide grants that will pay states administrative and startup costs when they establish paid leave mechanisms. And I should add, and let me say I'm going off script here, uh, I should add the, the paid leave fund is agnostic with respect to the kind of system that gets established by the states. It just wants to encourage states to establish systems that provide paid leave. Fourth, we need more and better information. When we make policy choices, they must be informed by the very best data. For this reason, the President's 2011 budget will allow the Department of Labor to complete a much needed new survey to assess the scope and dimensions of workers' need for time off from work. Finally, we can't make the changes we need with respect to workplace flexibility unless we engage and learn from the private sector, state and local efforts, labor organizations, and workers across the country who've been responding to these realities in the workplace in innovative ways. Following up on the March 31st White House Forum on Workplace Flexibility, the DOL Women's Bureau has been tasked with leading a series of conversations about workplace flexibility around the country. At the White House Forum, diverse stakeholders shared their experiences and insights on workplace flexibility and identified strategies to enhance access to flexibility. Business leaders at the forum talked about why workplace flexibility practice is a business imperative. As the CEO of Campbell Soup said, flexibility is a necessity now. And let me, if I can, just pause and uh, extend my praise to SHRM for coming forward with its own paid leave proposal. Uh, not necessarily an easy thing to do for an organization that works as closely as it does with others in the business community who perhaps show less enthusiasm than they should for paid leave. I think it showed a good amount of, uh, a not insubstantial amount of courage for SHRM to come forward with their proposal. And I'm looking forward to learning more about it at, uh, at, in their presentation today. Advocates for women, labor, older workers, military families, and low-wage workers spoke to the, at, at the President's Forum to the range of reasons why people need paid time off, flexible and predictable schedules, and how unions have built some of these policies into their collective bargaining agreements. We need to continue this educational process with working families, telling their own stories about why paid time off from work is so critical to expanding and strengthening the middle class. And the Women's Bureau is going to continue that effort in the weeks and months to come. So in sum, Secretary Solis and I are committed to improving access to workplace flexibility, and we look forward to working with all of you as we move forward. I'm looking forward to your questions, your comments, your criticisms, if you have them, and I hope you do, uh, fr from everybody that's here today. But I also look forward to continuing this discussion long after today's event. I view today as another step in the beginning of what I think is going to be a long and productive process. So, David, thank you again for having me. Thank you all, everyone. Thank you, Seth, for your comments and for your leadership on this issue. Now, Lisa Horn, who is the healthcare manager at the Society for Human Resource Management, as Seth mentioned, SHRM has taken a leadership role in this particular area of workplace flexibility. And as well, many SHRM members uh, as employers are also parents and have caregiving opportunities and responsibilities and care deeply about how to provide support for their employees as well. And so the private sector, as Seth mentioned, has a lot to, to teach the public sector and vice versa. So please join me in welcoming Lisa Horn. Lisa. all the way back through that, right, Sharon? Okay. Um, well, thank you, David. Thank you to the New America Foundation. It's great to really be here with this, these very distinguished uh, individuals. Uh, but most importantly, it's great to be speaking in the cleanup role here today uh, in order to hopefully provide all of you with a little um, employer perspective on leave policy issues. Um, and on leave policy, but more specifically on extended uh, time off policies. So I've been asked to provide um, the business perspective or reaction to some of the policies you've heard today. 
Um, but you should know that my comments uh, today are given through the lens of our members, SHRM members who are HR professionals. Um, our 250,000 members are those uh, professionals who really are on the front lines of this issue. Um, they're dealing with this um, in real time, day in and day out, uh, both from the management perspective and both um, from the employee perspective. Uh, so they're really kind of uniquely qualified to offer um, perspective um, on this uh, critically important issue. Uh, so, and at the same time, um, I too, Jody, your slides were fantastic, and I don't have any really cool data points. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a researcher, but I will again try to um, uh, pr provide some real world uh, expected, uh, perspective. So all of our speakers today did a, a great job of laying out the reasons why we're here today talking about leave policies. Um, as the demographics of the workforce change, uh, we've got more women working. Uh, more importantly, what two thirds of them now are either the co-breadwinner or the sole uh, breadwinner, as we heard in the Shriver report. Um, and uh, as we heard others mention, this isn't just a woman's issue. We have more and more men are experiencing um, work-life conflict. Uh, and so, and with growing number of caregivers as well. So it's obvious that the need, that the need is there uh, for extended um, time off. The good news is that, uh, by and large, employers are responding to this uh, increased need for time off by offering voluntary paid leave benefits and other work-life policies and programs. Um, I'm going to say a little bit uh, more about that later. Uh, but first, I keep thinking I have to point this at something, but I don't. Uh, but first, I think it's important to uh, examine employers' experience uh, with the mandated uh, leave that we have out there already, um, and that is leave provided under the Family and Medical Leave Act, or FMLA. Um, and the experience really has been mixed. Um, obviously, FMLA leave has benefited millions uh, of employees, uh, including yours truly here, in helping to meet um, employees, family, and medical needs. And when FMLA is taken for purposes of welcoming uh, a new family member, whether it's the birth, adoption, uh, or foster care placement of a child, the law has generally worked smoothly. A uh, few challenges, in other words. Um, because these um, events or situations, for lack of a better term, are typically planned, um, you can see them co uh, coming, there's sufficient notification, and that allows an employer in turn uh, to um, work, uh, uh, bring in a temporary help, assign work to other employees, um, et cetera. Uh, so the message here is a positive one, and that the family leave portion of FMLA is in fact um, working. Now, uh, as for the medical leave uh, provisions of the act, uh, when the leave is taken in these big chunks of time or big blocks of time, uh, say for extended treatment for a very um, serious illness that you know we can all um, um, think of, perhaps we've all been touched by, as I have, cancer um, and other very serious um, illnesses. Uh, it also, um, it, there's fewer challenges experienced here um, from an employer perspective as well. Because these types of treatment regimens and the like are uh, typically worked out between employer and employee uh, well in advance, again, with sufficient uh, sufficient notification. Uh, but medical leave under the Act can present uh, significant challenges when it comes to leave for serious health conditions that are episodic. Um, and episodic we mean um, that, that they really occur uh, sporadically and with little or no notice. Um, think of ailments such as uh, back pain, um, or I think Katie uh, pointed to uh, migraines, which in and of themselves are, in fact, serious health conditions, um, but they're unique in that, um, you know, you experience a, a flare-up of those ailments at unexpected uh, um, times. Um, this unscheduled intermittent leave, it, it's probably the most vexing issue out there for employers with respect to um, um, FMLA, and I think that came through uh, loud and clear through um, the Department uh, of Labor's request for information process that they engaged in, uh, wow, um, uh, 0607, uh, and finalized um, in their report uh, when they looked at the effectiveness of the FML, uh, FMLA regulations. Now, I don't mean to suggest by any means um, that the, the types of um, 
uh, the ailments, serious health conditions, that these aren't, again, serious in nature because they are, and that they don't warrant unscheduled leave because, sure, they may, in fact, um, uh, will need that type of leave. The challenge here comes in when employers start to see this questionable pattern of leave um, with respect to some of these ailments. And there's lots and lots of um, um, examples that you can and look at through that, um, the commentary provided to the department um, in years past into what some of those questionable pat patterns look like. And it causes employers to question um, the legit legitimacy uh, of the actual leave. I have a couple of slides. I, I, they're a little dated. They are, did come, in fact, before um, FMLA was expanded with the military leave as well as for the um, uh, efforts on the flight attendants. Uh, but I think that this 2000 survey of um, HR professionals and their experience with the FMLA does, in fact, underscore the distinction between uh, medical leave versus family leave. Again, um, nearly half of HR professionals surveyed here, roughly 40, 47%, um, suggested that they had, in fact, experienced these challenges um, administering FMLA leave for an employee's serious health condition as a result of what I termed the episodic uh, condition. But then compare that um, with uh, administering leave for um, you know, the birth, adoption, or foster care um, placement of a child, and only 13%. So you can see there is, um, in fact, a distinction to be made in where the difficulties uh, do lie. Uh, additional FMLA administration challenges reported by HR professionals uh, include the tracking and the administration of intermittent leave. Again, these are very, very small increments of time that employees are able to um, take leave, uh, and that can be cause uh, administrative challenges um, with tracking that, 80%. Um, and also, a large number of, sh of HR professionals report um, um, difficulties in determining what, in fact, uh, constitutes a, a serious health health condition um, under the Act. Uh, and this is in despite, you know, even though that the FMLA has been around for over 15 years, um, employers, again, they continue to uh, struggle to understand it. Uh, it really began as a fairly uh, simple, I think roughly 12-page bill, and now um, it's over 200 pages of uh, regulations governing how the law is to be implemented. And just to kind of underscore the com complexity uh, of the f this federal mandate, um, I consider this. Uh, SHRM, we have what's known as our SHRM Knowledge Center, staffed with um, HR knowledge advisors. It's kind of like the Congressional Research Service uh, at, is to Congress as the SHRM Knowledge Center is uh, to HR professionals. Um, and our Knowledge Center receives more inquiries regarding um, the Family and Medical Leave Act than any other uh, federal employment statute. Um, the Fair Labor Standards Act does, in fact, come in second. Um, but to give you an idea of how many inquiries this actually amounts to, um, I did some checking, and um, from June, or January to June of this year, our Knowledge Center has fielded over 40,000 requests for information, uh, and they take these requests for information, instant message, um, email, phone calls, of course, uh, all, all mediums. Uh, so 40,000 requests and roughly 35 to 40 percent of those are questions about FMLA implementation. Um, so I'm no mathematician, but I think roughly that's like 15 uh, to, thou 15 to 16,000 inquiries on how to administer uh, F um, FMLA. So again, there is a real um, uh, complexity in understanding the law and implementing it on the ground at the work site. Uh, just uh, t further there, the two most prevalent questions that they tend to get at the Knowledge Center, um, again, what is exactly a serious health condition, and uh, questions related um, to medical certification under the Act, uh, namely, how does you know, the med cert process work, and um, what you can and cannot ask uh, regarding a medical certification. So um, the takeaway here is that even uh, well-intentioned uh, mandates that attempt to anticipate and micromanage every situation in every workplace and in every industry without regard uh, for the evolving and diverse needs of today's workforce or, uh, or the new operations and technologies that organizations employ to stay competitive, um, they're just uh, counterproductive. 
I mentioned earlier uh, that businesses understand the changing needs of the workforce uh, and are constantly looking to design those innovative workplace policies uh, that in fact improve um, employee morale and retention, uh, not to mention recruitment, uh, because these are all essential elements in developing and maintaining that productive workforce. Employers are responding to employees' increased need for work-life balance by offering both flexible work arrangements and paid time off. And roughly 75% of employers voluntarily offer various forms of paid leave, which can take on, we have saw a number of them highlighted today, vacation, sick leave, personal days, um, uh, short-term disability and the like as part of their uh, overall total compensation package. Uh, we're seeing a growing number of employers moving away from traditional paid sick leave and paid vacation leave and moving more into the more modern um, offering known, uh, known as paid time off banks or PTO banks. Uh, roughly uh, according to our 2009 benefits survey, 42 percent of organizations are offering uh, PTO banks. These are particularly uh, um, popular with employees who really like the idea of just having a block of time to use as they see fit. Uh, they don't have to use, um, have separate buckets for sick and vacation. So if they in fact have time, um, they, you know, they don't have to, uh, you know, have the fake call in sick uh, uh, call that sometimes happens and HR professionals like it because it gets them out of the, the realm of policing the leave, which is certainly uh, not what they want to do nor, in some cases, do employees want to share that. Em employers don't want to receive it. Employees uh, don't want to give it. So again, a more modern offering that we're seeing a growing trend in. Uh, mandated leave, on the other hand, uh, restricts employers' flexibility and their ability to be creative in responding to, again, those very different workforce needs. Uh, this is an especially important lesson when attempting to meet the evolving needs and desires of today's workforce. Um, it's not only, uh, it's a really flexible workforce and it's quite mobile for workforce. So while restricting employers' flexibility is, again, a key concern for employers, uh, there's others too, and I'll just run through these quickly. Um, there's a real concern out there about how any additional leave uh, requirement or mandate would intersect with other leave statutes. Um, in recent years, we've seen more and more activity at the state and local leave, or at the state and local level with respect to leave requirements, um, thus forcing some employers to uh, comply now with uh, this patchwork of varying federal, state, and local leave laws, which is particularly problematic for your multi-state employers. Um, as it stands now, we already hear from our members quite frequently um, about their challenges in trying to navigate these various um, sometimes conflicting requirements um, or overlapping state and federal um, leave and disability laws. And so while they're maybe trying to a, make a good faith effort to comply with run, one, they find themselves running afoul of another. Uh, the second concern would be um, uh, it's really both an employer and an employee concern, is this fear that enactment of um, another mandate may in fact uh, cause employers to scale back um, either their leave requirements or other um, important benefits in order to comply um, with the new requirement. We did hear this from um, members um, after enactment of the Family and Medical Leave Act, and I think that is a real concern today. Uh, and finally, uh, we cannot overlook cost concerns uh, with additional leave requirements, uh, especially in the current environment uh, with so many uh, out-of-work Americans. So after years and years and years, it feels like, of contemplating um, leave policy and hearing from our members on these issues, uh, Sherm decided that we need to start a different conversation about leave policy. Uh, we think we need to give employees more choices. That's what they're clamoring for. Um, and at the same time, give employers more predictability when it comes to a federal leave policy. Uh, we think employers should be encouraged uh, to provide the paid leave that their workforces need and let employees decide how to use it. Uh, from our perspective, a government-mandated approach to providing leave is a clear example of what won't work, particularly during a time of economic crisis. Uh, simply put, employers need flexibility to create these innovative um, uh, programs and policies uh, to meet the needs of their employees. 
So this led to this development um, last uh, May of 2009 of a set of principles to really outline um, a 21st century workplace flexibility policy. Uh, principles that for the first time reflect the different needs and different work environments of different industries and most importantly of um, different uh, organizations, uh, small, medium, large. Um, as, as Katie pointed out in her remarks, um, employers are doing a lot to advance work-life policies. And we think Congress should be building on what they're already doing by offering incentives for them to do more. So briefly, let me walk through these. Uh, first is this idea of shared uh, needs. We can't pursue leave policy that only works for employees or only works for employers. It should work for both. We should recognize that employers that are already offering generous leave benefits, um, we need to recognize them, but also encourage those who aren't currently offering um, these benefits to do so. Um, and so therefore, we've envisioned this uh, idea of a safe harbor approach, um, where employers who voluntarily offer a specified number of paid leave days for employees to use for any reason, um, that they would in turn uh, be deemed to have satisfied state, federal, and local leave laws. Uh, second, uh, is the principle uh, focused on employee leave. As I mentioned, we think public, public policy should encourage employers to offer leave um, to be used uh, as employees see fit, whether that be for illness, vacation, uh, personal or family needs, or simply because uh, you, know, you want to check out for the day. It's really their um, leave to use as they see fit. Uh, we also think that a federal policy should incorporate maximum flexibility. Um, it should encourage uh, that flexibility for employees as well as employers. Uh, the policy should be scalable. Um, it, it must avoid this idea of a one-size-fits-all approach and instead recognize that paid leave offerings should accommodate um, the increasing diversity of workforce needs and environments. Um, we could scale, um, scale the leave to the number of employees at an organization, uh, perhaps to the type um, of operations at the organization uh, and the like. And finally, we think a federal policy should support and encourage flexible work options. Uh, both employees and employers can benefit from a public policy that meets the diverse needs of the workplace in supporting and encouraging flexible work options, uh, such as telecommuting, uh, job sharing, uh, reduced or compressed uh, schedules, um, and the like. Uh, you can read more about our principles on our website, which is www.sherm.org backslash Sherm is HR. And at the end of the day, we share the same goal as many uh, in the advocacy community, which is to increase access to paid leave and other workplace policies. We may, however, uh, disagree on how to do that. But we have developed these policies or these principles as a way to spur dialogue, as a way to demonstrate a path forward on leave policy absent new employer requirements. And we welcome any and all feedback from all stakeholders. Look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Lisa. I'll encourage our panelists to come forward and sit here if we could for q and I know we have a lot of expertise in the audience here. And in the interest of time, I'm going to ask that we begin by stacking questions. So I'm going to take two at a time just right off the bat. Uh, when you ask your question, Maggie's going to come by with a, um, with a mic. State your, um, your name and your organization, if you wouldn't mind, and ask a very brief question, if you would. And we're going to take two of them here. I'm going to take this hand and then um, Mark's over here. Uh, and we'll just um, answer two as we go along. Yeah, I'm Sonia Michelle from uh, Director of U.S. Studies at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, I have two questions. One is, I think all of this stuff about leave is fantastic, but the other side of the equation is childcare. What um, consideration are you being given? Are you giving to childcare? Do you see any opening for doing anything about uh, government support for childcare at this point? And the second is that flexibility. When I hear the word flexibility, I get a little worried because um, it often means flexibility for the employer, but not necessarily for the employee. And it also often means. Um, you know, f comp compulsory overtime, so forth and so on. So, are you taking into consideration predictable uh, the requirement for predictable work, work schedules as part of these arrangements? Okay, great. Then, Mark. Thank you, uh, Mark Friedman with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, as a representative of a group who is uh, maybe less enthusiastic about 
ensuring paid leave than perhaps we should be. <laughs> uh, let's just, let me just stipulate, or let's just stipulate for the sake of today's discussion that paid leave is necessary, desirable, and that we're all embarrassed to be in the United States. Uh, a country where people are trying to get in to start new lives and, and start new businesses. Uh, my basic question, I guess, and I guess this is to you, Seth, is you know, why is there such lackluster political support for the measures that would achieve some of these goals? Uh, I really thought that with the, the Congress coming in with the large Democratic majorities and the President supporting his policies, we were going to see some action right out of the box, and, and nothing has happened. So I guess my question is why, and, and how do you explain that? All right, so we have three questions. And Jody, I don't know if you want to start. We have child care and, and, and the predictability uh, questions. And then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let uh, anyone else jump in. We'll give Seth an opportunity to talk about the politics. Sure. Um, on the child care side, I guess um, more than an answer, I want to add something to it as a friendly amendment, which is, I would say, uh, child care and elder care. So, I mean, I think, I think there are two quick things to be said. Uh, one is that we, we know, and I know you know very well, Sonia and could, could lead us, us all in a whole session on it, the investment in zero to five is immensely valuable. Um, so Nobel laureate economists coming out with how, how many dollars returned for each dollar invested. Uh, educational outcomes, which we need to be more competitive on, driven by that social expenditures down. So, you know, just wholehearted support on that. I, I would just say in terms of when we're thinking about that, we have to think about elder care too. What we know about the costs on these is if we started investing in giving people time off to help keep uh, those who are aging home, our costs would be lower, so our ability to invest here would be better if we do it on the paid leave side. I, I do want to say one quick thing um, about feasibility on long-term paid leave, I guess sparked by Mark's question, but also by something Lisa said, which is, um, should there be no government policy? And I, I found much of what you said incredibly important about the particular challenges of intermittent leave, et cetera. And, and I, I certainly would love to see the business community coming out for a minimum number of paid days off that would exempt other short-term policies. I mean, if we, if we saw a reasonable number of paid days off that would cover the short-term piece, I think that would be fantastic. On the long term, what our global data shows, if we looked in detail at those maps from around the world that I showed of paid parental leave and paid sick leave, there simply is no country that provides long-term paid sick leave on a volunteer, uh, by businesses or long-term paid parental leave. And that's because it's just too costly for the business community to do alone. So I think that's a place where we really have to think separately, how do we make it affordable for the business community? And they're almost is no way other than either a social insurance or a substantial tax credit program. Sharon, do you want to talk at all about um, predictability or do you mean to say a word or? Um, sure. Um, first of all, I just also want to reiterate what Seth had said in terms of thank you to Lisa for bravely entering this dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, as you can tell from her remarks and our remarks, we don't necessarily agree on the policy answers, um, but we really welcome the business community coming to the table, talking, looking for um, solutions. So I just want to say thanks again for that. Um, in terms of predictability, um, I think your point about flexibility and what the word meant um, means probably back about 10 years ago when you heard about flexibility, it was all about employer's flexibility. Um, I think um, the term has evolved over time to not just mean comp time, I move over time, um, but to really look at the full range of options that give people the flexibility they need to balance both um, their work responsibilities and their work responsibilities outside of the home. Um, one of the things that we at WF 2010 have spent a lot of time looking at is, well, what about for low-income workers? Is that what they need? I mean, arguably, they have too much flexibility. They don't know what their um, schedule is going to be from week to week. So we've actually because we define our terms, we can define them the way we want. We've defined workplace flexibility 
to include predictability over schedules. Right. Um, because it's the predi <coughs> predictability that is so critical um, for those workers to figure out what are their child care needs, how do you arrange for child care. Um, so I just want to totally agree and echo your point. Um, and the other question about child care, I think actually child care and paid um, time off are kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, the issue being you have children, they need care. Um, so child care is critical. I think we have focused um, at WF 2010 on what happens if you don't have that access to child care, either just your day-to-day -day child care, um, when you have a newborn child who can't even go into daycare yet, um, or what if you have really good child care set up, but your kid is sick, or you know your kid has lice and the school nurse calls at 10 in the morning. Um, no matter how good child care will be, there's always always going to be a need for time off as well. Lisa, do you want to add? Uh, yeah, a couple of things there. Um, Sharon, <coughs> echo Sharon's comments on the predictability, flexibility. Uh, for, from Sherm's perspective, it runs both ways. Uh, there's predictability for the employee in terms of, of scheduling, but also um, from the employer, because I think that that's what, what you saw in some of those um, the challenges, particularly with the unscheduled intermittent leave for episodic conditions, that, that it's the predictability. And, and granted, if you're talking a catastrophic condition, we know that there's not going to be any, you know, advance notice if you get hit by a car when we step outside the building, which I hope not that happens to none of us. Um, we know that. But even with some of the episodic conditions, we realize that that's not always going to be feasible. But that is one in where one of the rubs are. Um, your comment about daycare, uh, daycare dependent care. Uh, makes me think of my daycare bills. And uh, more importantly, um, uh, legislation that I, I believe Senator Lincoln has championed over time, and I believe Senator Snow as well, uh, to raise with respect to the dependent care uh, flexible spending account amount. You know, it's currently $5,000. Uh, that would get me till, I don't know, the 1st of March maybe. Right. Um, and so there has been efforts underway to raise that, but we all know in, in the current environment how difficult that is given um, the, the costs associated with doing so and concerns about um, uh, deficit spending. So. Um, Thanks, Lisa. Great. Right. Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll pick up on the uh, uh, on the flexibility point <coughs> as a way of uh, 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 entering into Mark's question. Um, the uh, I think you're exactly right. Is that in and this is one of the great values of of workplace flexibility 2010 is the need to define terms fairly clearly. Um, if if we all acknowledge that both employers and workers have legitimate interests and that there is a substantial amount of overlap with respect to what those interests are, it becomes a lot easier to solve this problem. It's not easy, but it becomes easier. Um, so this, uh, this question of how one assures flexibility while also assuring predictability is a very hard question, and we have to acknowledge that. Um, if, you know, if a worker comes down with a serious illness or if a worker with a disability has episodic uh, um, uh, flare-ups of a particular condition, um, it's, it's very difficult to give the employer sufficient advance notice so that the employer can assure that they have a substitute worker or that they've prepared the other people in the workplace to expand their capacity to be available to cover for that particular worker. It depends on the workplace. Um, but at the same time, if a worker is sick, they shouldn't go to work. Uh, I, I, I testified during the H1N1 uh, pandemic on this subject, and we were telling workers, uh, the president was telling workers, if you're sick, stay home. That's just not a reality for, for an unfortunately large number of workers uh, that, the, that you could stay home and thereby engage in what we then called community mitigation which means put some distance between yourself and other people you might make sick uh, without risking their jobs uh, or certainly without risking their paychecks. So I, I think the starting place is to say, you know what, we all have legitimate interests here. Um, and uh, uh, on Mark's point about why is it that we haven't made more progress in, in, in the first uh, 15, 16 months of the President's term, We've made some progress, I think. The, I think the flight attendants, family medical leave, the military uh, families, uh, family medical leave discussions about healthy families show that there is, I think, an appetite. The surest way for us to make progress on this issue 
uh, that will benefit all of us is to use the model that, uh, that the chamber and, and Chai and other folks at, uh, at Georgetown and folks in the disability community used in dealing with the ADA Amendments Act. Mm -hmm. Another place where there are common interests, a lot of overlapping interests, some genuine tensions, but everybody sat down, laid their interests on the table, and tried to work out what was a reasonable deal that, that maybe wasn't what any one side or the other would have wanted, but I think, and I say this as a disability, in my former life as a disability scholar, significantly moved the ball forward for everyone. It gave a lot more certainty to employers. It gave, I think, uh, uh, more expansive rights to workers and gave them greater protections. That, to me, that's a model for how we can move forward. That's why I, I think that Sherm's participation in this debate is so critical. Uh, the, the, uh, the principles, at least at a very fairly high level of principle that Lisa laid out, are principles that I don't have any problem embracing at all. I have no problem embracing the, the, the concern that employers have about how do we, how do we deal with last minute work shortages because workers stayed home. That's, that's a legitimate concern. But it's, we should treat it not as the end of the discussion, but as the beginning of the discussion. So I think that there's lots of room for solving this problem. Uh, and, and it's a multifaceted, complicated problem. We just need to acknowledge that. So the fact that, that in the midst of, of you know, the worst recession in 70 years, two wars, and the health care debate, that we haven't also solved this very difficult problem doesn't give me cause for pessimism. And I actually think there's a lot of cause for optimism. All right, Seth, thank you very much. I would love to take more questions. In the interest of time and schedules, I will not, and that's not a bad place to end with the optimistic note that Seth just left us with. <laughs> <laughs> Giving him the last word. Um, thank you for joining us today, and thank you to all four of our, all four and a half, five of our <laughs> panelists, we get Katie, uh, to, uh, for taking time to be with us today. Take a look at Jody's website and her books, and the research is, is compelling <coughs> in this, as well as what Sherm is doing in this area that Lisa has shared. I know you'll all be joining WF 2010 when they release their report as well. And Seth, thank you for your leadership and what you're doing. All right, thank you.